started as drips and drops of PlayStation exclusive games, is slowly turning into a deluge now with Death Stranding coming out on PC. Powered by Guerrilla Games' Decima engine, this game pushes the envelope for character rendering in video games and boasts wonderfully crafted terrain effects and models. With it being on PC now, it also has the chance to strut its stuff at higher frame rates, settings, and resolutions. So in this review video here for Death Stranding on PC, I will be covering the features that this PC version has and does not have, how it pushes the graphics above the PlayStation 4 Pro version, and what performance can be expected on a number of PC configurations with my optimized settings. So let's get ready, strap up, and talk about how Kojima Productions has delivered the definitive version of Death Stranding on PC. So let's get right into the thick of it and talk about the features here in this version of Death Stranding. Right as you get into the menu, you'll notice a fair amount of options with some areas being less tweakable or more tweakable than you're used to. HDR, yes, it's in all right if you have an HDR monitor and have HDR switched on in the Windows settings. The control over HDR in game itself is not as fine grained as in other titles on PC or console, but it is great to see HDR here where other PC versions of large titles have sometimes skipped out on it in the past. While this video is an SDR, I must praise the HDR presentation in this game for its usage of that extra dynamic range and light brightness. You cannot see it here of course in the video, but there's a rather large difference in the look of the image for those areas that are dark, like the undersides of rock faces, or in those areas that are especially bright, like the sun behind the clouds. The SDR image in this game in comparison is a lot grayer looking than the HDR one. While HDR is in, there's no way to control the game's standard camera field of view, so no FOV slider. The game does have a generally much higher FOV than most other console games, so it's not the worst thing, but I can imagine some players keenly feeling its absence. As we will come to see through this video, some parts of the experience seem purposefully untweakable for artistic control reasons rather than technical ones, and this may be one of them. FOV tweaking may be out, but the game does allow you to extend the FOV horizontally in 21x9 support for those of you with cinematic monitors out there. I did not spend too much time testing this mode, but it appears to work like it should in cutscenes and in gameplay by extending the field of view horizontally and not zooming into a 16x9 image. Along with the ability to choose aspect ratio, you of course have resolution control, but in a more limited fashion than you may be used to. The game really only supports a certain list of resolutions that it deems okay, so any more oddball resolutions or custom resolutions are not choosable in the menu or are not able to be forced in the game's config file located in the directory. So if you want to try out something like 1800p or 1620p or any other non-standard resolution, it won't work. On my 4K monitor, I could only really use 4K, 1440p, 1080p, and 720p essentially. When choosing resolution, you're also not given separate control over your refresh rate. So like in many other DirectX 12 and Vulkan apps, there's no real exclusive full screen here. To choose different refresh rates, you must first set your desktop refresh rate to that which you want, and then the game will automatically use that refresh rate. Now a big deal in this version of course is not just the ability to run the game at the typical higher than console 60 FPS, but all the way up to 240 FPS as the in-game FPS limiter allows. But before we talk about high frame rate, I must comment on how much better this game looks at just 60 FPS over the PlayStation 4 Pro version. It also importantly feels so much better to play. For this review, I was switching back and forth between the PS4 Pro and PC version running at 60 FPS to do the graphics comparison work, and it felt so much tighter to control and it was much more visually responsive. At above 60 FPS, the PC version goes into sublime territory, where animation work in gameplay looks absolutely fantastic as it mixes with Decima Engine's per object motion blur. Don't take my word for it though, let's just take a second here to appreciate all that animation in slow motion. While high frame rate above 60 FPS works amazingly in gameplay as you see here, not everything is completely unlocked. Or at least I don't think it's completely unlocked. 
When running the game without VSync, I found that cinematics of all types are locked to 60 FPS. Turning on VSync keeps cinematics locked to 60 as well, but one time while playing the game at 120 Hz, with VSync on, I saw this cinematic here go above 60 FPS. But just this cinematic here. Or even weirder, I once saw a cinematic sequence start at 60 FPS when I was playing at 60 Hz, but it changed its frame rate midway through the cutscene. When this happened, the amount of frames per second being produced was still 60, which you can see in the changes in the environment like the plant movement or rain movement, but the rate of character animations and camera movement in this cinematic were 30 FPS. This happened only one time during my entire 9 hours of play, and I could not reproduce it after running the cinematic 6-7 to seven times in a row, but I did find it curious that it happened at all. While I do find it disappointing that the cinematics cannot typically run above 60 FPS, I cannot begrudge Kojima Productions too much, as this game and this engine were designed around 30 FPS on consoles. Heck, for this version they even re-encoded all the pre-rendered footage out to 60 FPS and 4K. Who knows, maybe their future games with Decima on PC will take into account variable and unlocked frame rates more gracefully for cinematics, but this is still a great start. In terms of other graphical options, there's not much here. You have shadow resolution, texture streaming size, model quality, and then the ability to turn off depth of field, screen space ambient inclusion, or motion blur. Beyond this, you have the ability to turn off all anti-aliasing, use FXAA, or use TAA. The big bombshell here though in the options is that this game supports NVIDIA's Deep Learning Super Sampling 2.0, which renders the game at a lower internal resolution and then utilizes information from previous frames and a real-time AI program running on the GPU to increase that frame's resolution. So the game internally running at 1440p, but looking like 4K. Next to DLSS, there's also the AMD OpenGPU effect of contrast adaptive sharpening included here as well. In this game, the CAS toggle does two things. First, it reduces the resolution on each axis to 75%. So if you had a 4K output resolution selected, then the game does its rendering actually at 2880 by 1620. Then on top of this lowered resolution, you can apply the anti-aliasing type of your liking, or you can apply selective sharpening to that image in a strength that you desire. When changing these options, it's important to note that a number of them only affect gameplay graphics and not cutscene graphics, so turning off something like depth of field only turns off that effect in gameplay, while other toggles like motion blur affect both gameplay and cutscenes. Even with such few options, I bet you're wondering, where does the PS4 Pro stack up against these options, and how do they perform? Given we have so few to tweak here, it's actually rather easy to find this out. First off, we have the model detail setting, which controls the quality of model level of detail into the distance. The higher this setting is, the less pop-in that occurs close to the camera, and the more detail you will see into the distance. Here there is very little difference in performance between the settings at native 4K on the RTX 2080 Ti. Being GPU limited, I saw single percentage performance advantages when going down from very high to default or from default to medium, and going to the low setting did not perform better than medium at all. To check out the PS4 Pro settings for this option, I looked at the camera distance at which this rock in the distance here changes to its highest level of detail. On the PS4 Pro, the rock changed its level of detail around here. Lo and behold, this distance is the exact same as the default setting on PC. The very high setting above default has that rock reach its highest level of detail further into the distance. Given how little this option costs on the GPU, I was wondering why this setting could not even go further on PC, or why not further on PS4 Pro for that matter. So I checked out its cost on the CPU side. When CPU limited, I saw that going from the highest to the lowest setting with this option saw only a 5% performance increase. As is, I recommend anyone with a modern PC to use the highest setting. After this option, we have the shadow resolution setting. Here, this setting only seems to change the resolution of shadow maps from indoor lights and not from sunlight shadows. As I say that though, I could not find a visual difference between the medium and high setting. Only the low setting looked decidedly lower resolution. And back to backs, I would say the PlayStation 4 Pro here either uses high or medium, which look exactly the same. Here's where I will mention something funny about this game's graphical settings. When you load the game for the first time, it loads the default settings, which to me is a not so subtle indicator that the game on PS4 Pro also uses these default settings. 
This is something Hideo Kojima has done in the past in a game like Metal Gear Solid 5, where if you loaded that game up for the first time, the default settings were those exact same settings used on console. In terms of performance, I could not at all see a change in FPS on the RTX 2080 Ti at 4K when changing the shadow setting. Rather, it looks to affect GPU memory here more than real-time performance. In this scene here, I saw medium shadows using 700 megabytes less VRAM than high shadows, yet low shadows did not really change the GPU memory budget here in this scene. Reloading the scene up again from a different angle, I saw scarcely a difference between high and medium memory consumption, but low shadows suddenly was using nearly 300 megabytes less memory than medium settings. So this certainly has an effect on VRAM usage, but is inconsistent and based upon your view. As is, I recommend sticking to high or medium here, but it does not really seem to matter which one from a visual standpoint. As a word of warning though, I recommend you be careful when changing this setting in real time. Sometimes after changing from low to high shadows, for example, the shadows still stuck to their low resolution. Lastly, we have the texture setting, which controls the amount of VRAM that can be used to cache textures. Here I noticed no visual difference between the high and default setting. The low setting though uses noticeably lower resolution textures for objects close to the camera. With no visual difference between the high and quote unquote default setting, PS4 Pro could use either of the two. But if I were to take a guess once again based upon the game's default settings, it probably uses that default setting on PS4 Pro. Between these texture settings there are minor differences in performance and VRAM. Going from high to default in this scene saw equivalent VRAM usage and frame rate, but going down to low decreased VRAM usage by about 500 megabytes and increased the frame rate by 3%. Here I recommend the default setting for my optimized settings. While textures look the same in this version, a nice upgrade that you get for free on PC is in anisotropic filtering. On PlayStation 4 Pro, the game looks to utilize something like 4 times anisotropic filtering on all surfaces where textures kind of turn into a muddy soup at a distance. On PC, it looks to default to an unchanging 16 times AF no matter what your settings are. There's not even a way to change anisotropic filtering in game. After textures, every single other setting is enabled of course on PS4 Pro as these settings are integral to the game's visual style. So, SSAO, as I see it, should be left to on, but if you happen to have a toaster, turning it off will yield this game's biggest performance win of 11% better performance. The SSR used in Decima is of an older, less visually accurate variety, so it does not cost as much as other SSRs we have seen in other games. I recommend leaving it on, but should your potato be particularly old, you can increase performance by around 4% in a worst case scenario by turning it off. Motion blur? Well, if you don't like it, turn it off. In testing though, I could not find any performance advantage for turning it off. In this cutscene, for example, it has the exact same performance on as it does off on an RTX 2070 Super. Similar to motion blur, if you dislike depth of field, you can turn it off, but it will only affect those rarer instances in gameplay where depth of field comes on. You can see this best in the personal quarters you have in Outposts. Turning off depth of field in this scene, for example, yields around 3% better performance. Regarding anti-aliasing, if you're not utilizing DLSS, I can only recommend the TAA option in this game as it is a modern game engine filled with PBR materials and a lot of reflections and specularity. The TAA in Decima Engine is most similar to SMAA 2TX, which you might have seen in other games, so it's not overly soft, but it can still ghost from time to time. It is cheap though and has better coverage than FXAA. When taking a look back at these few settings, the highest settings in the game are not dramatically more expensive than the standard PS4 Pro settings, and my optimized settings are not too different from the highest settings. So the starkest differences between the PC version and the console version are either baked in or cheap. This is a bit of a shame as some aspects of the visuals should be able to be pushed out further as a more extreme option I feel. Like depth of field for example. Instead of an on and off toggle for depth of field, I would also like to have seen an ultra option which turns up its fixed internal resolution. On both console and on PC, 
The depth of field is low resolution internally, which causes flickering and aliasing in cutscenes even if your external resolution is very high. I would have also liked to seen other high-end options like an option to enable grass shadows, which are missing in both versions, or perhaps the ability to increase the resolution of the sky rendering. Maybe that's an update for the future or their next game. In the meantime though, the biggest upgrades here are really going to be that image quality and frame rate, which definitely do a lot to make this game look a good deal better than the PlayStation 4 Pro version. Now for the ins and outs of that discussion concerning image quality, I have also produced a DLSS versus checkerboarding video to accompany this video, which I recommend for you to check out when it's published. But in the meantime, I'm just going to talk about image quality here in this video with DLSS in isolation in comparison to native rendering. To put it lightly, if you have a desktop class GPU which can utilize DLSS, definitely use DLSS. DLSS in this game compares amazingly to its native resolution equivalents, especially in 4K. Check out this shot here of Fragile at 4K with Decima Engine's TAA. You will notice two things, I think. First, the quality of the resolution, which looks good, but then you'll notice that something's going on with her hair. It has a ghosted look to it. Previous frames here are visible in the current frame, so it looks doubled up and odd. And if I put this scene in motion here, you could see that her hair is ghosting, but it is also aliased, so it flickers even at a massive 4K resolution with TAA. Now let's look at DLSS in quality mode, which is rendered internally at 1440p and then reconstructed up to 4K. Notice how the hair in comparison no longer has that ghosted look to it, so the image is much clearer overall. If you watch that shot in motion in comparison to 4K with TAA, you can see how the DLSS version of that scene has less aliasing in motion, so there's less flicker in her hair in the DLSS version. If you stop a cutscene in motion where TAA is not ghosting, you can also see that DLSS in quality mode actually resolves more stable detail, like here where the hair has less aliasing than in the native 4K version. This doesn't just apply to hair, of course, but the entire image. DLSS in general in this game has less aliasing and flicker on movement than the game with native 4K and TAA, which is something you can see very well here in this shot on the ground. Notice how this shrubbery here is resolved with a similar amount of detail between the DLSS version and the native 4K version, but the DLSS version also is not flickering in motion since it is anti-aliased better than the native version. This is in quality mode though. If you go down to performance mode in DLSS, you will see a similar amount of detail produced to the 4K native image, but it will be less stable detail and will showcase more aliasing. Like of this shot here of the hair in the game, DS quality mode exceeds native rendering with TAA. Performance mode on the other hand is not as good at reconstructing that hair. These are just some examples though, and my other video on this topic will cover it in greater depth, also with comparisons to checkerboard rendering. If you do not have a GPU that uses DLSS, you can also try out the contrast adaptive sharpening option. This option works much like it does in other games, and does not appear to be reconstructing the image up from its lower 1620p resolution in Death Stranding, so it is not like DLSS 2.0. Let us look at an example with it in this scene here. Let's compare the ground and this bush here at native 4K with TAA, with that same scene with contrast adaptive sharpening with TAA on and the sharpening slider set to 50. In the CAS side here of the image, you can see how that bush and the ground surrounding that bush look chunky and lower resolution in comparison to the 4K native image. This makes sense, as there's no effective reconstruction occurring and the CAS image is running at a lower resolution really. If you compare that same shot with DLSS in quality mode, you can see the difference that an effective reconstruction provides. DLSS is producing non-chunky 4K pixels here that are not upscaled like the CAS image. With these results between DLSS and native, my recommendation for this game is to run the game with DLSS in lieu of native resolution with TAA. In fact, all of my footage of gameplay that you have seen in this video so far that is not labeled as native was run with 4K DLSS in quality mode because I actually think it makes the game look the best. And performance is of course much better. DLSS in quality mode in this scene on an RTX 2080 Ti at 4K runs 38% better than native and the performance mode runs 70% better than native with slightly less robust results than quality mode.
Moving on to overall performance, your best area of scaling in this game are going to be resolution and the general single threaded performance of your CPU. That 120 FPS I showed off earlier in this video is rather easy to attain on the CPU side of things. On a Core i5-8400 in the prologue, I saw the lowest low of 125 FPS very briefly while purposefully lowering the resolution and GPU related settings so low that the GPU was no longer a bottleneck. If you notice in this performance capture I have here, the GPU is constantly beneath 100% utilization. This is occurring while the six cores of the Core i5-8400 are utilized to 80 or 90%, which is excellent utilization. The average frame rate here of this gameplay recording in the prologue is around 140 frames per second. This is amazing considering this engine targets 30 FPS on PlayStation 4, and from what we know from our studio visits to Guerrilla Games, it is generally tapping out the base console CPU. CPU scaling above this though is a bit flatter in Death Stranding. Increasing your core and thread count does not dramatically increase the frame rate. So when moving over to the comparatively massive Ryzen 3900X with 12 cores and 24 threads and an even faster frequency on top of better memory, the average frame rate throughout that same run moved up only by 20 FPS to 160 FPS on average. So in a CPU limited scenario, that is 15% higher average performance with 100% more cores and 200% more threads with faster memory and faster frequency. But not all is rosy in Ryzen land, as I noticed a performance bug on AMD that I did not see on Intel. The Ryzen 3900X of course had an overall higher frame rate and lower frame times on average, but it would also show a semi-constant tick downward in the frame time below 8.3 milliseconds to around 12 or 14 milliseconds. This may not seem like a big deal, but it does mean that the experience on a much more powerful and more expensive Ryzen is less fluid than a much cheaper and older Core i5-8400. If you wanted to lock the game to 120 FPS on the Ryzen machine, you would actually see stutter dips below 120 FPS. On the Intel machine, this would happen less often. Perhaps this is one of those instances where cross-CCX communication in Ryzen is causing an odd frame time problem due to the increased latency but I would also not be surprised if this is a fixable bug. So I hope Kojima Productions can look into Ryzen performance in frame times above 60 FPS, which I think could perhaps be better. On the GPU side of things, this game runs very well, but it is heavy. On the high-end scale, the RTX 2080 Ti can manage above 60 FPS at 4K on the highest settings in the vast majority of gameplay scenarios. But the GPU will see dips below 60 FPS in some cutscenes, or when you get too close to character hair or to other transparency effects like water. But I do not recommend native resolution in this game anyway, but instead DLSS, which generally looks better. With that on and in quality mode, the RTX 2080 Ti will run most scenes in this game in excess of 90 or 100 FPS at times. Moving down the RTX totem pole, you really can and should run this game with DLSS on and with my optimized settings. It is possible to run this game at 4K with DLSS and quality mode and at 60 FPS on nearly every single desktop RTX GPU. Only the base RTX 2060 version will require you to drop down to DLSS performance mode at 4K instead of quality mode as quality mode can see certain sequences drop into 50 FPS territory. This is perfectly fine on a variable refresh rate display but still it must be said. Over in non-RTX territory, older mid-range GPUs fare very well and much like you would expect them to based upon the 4K native performance I mentioned earlier with the RTX 2080 Ti. The older AMD RX 580 and NVIDIA GTX 1060 from yesteryear's mid-range get absolutely thrashed at 4K utilizing my optimized settings where most of the play or cutscenes will be in the 20 to 25 FPS range with some very rare spikes to near 30. So really, if there was an Xbox One X version of this game, I don't think it would be at 4K. Going down to 1440p, the story gets more interesting as the cards start to differentiate themselves more. At 1440p, both GPUs find themselves in the low to mid 40s at this resolution in cutscenes with very little difference between the cards. But the RX 580 in the prologue section in gameplay manages to be 14% faster on average than the GTX 1060. 
Here I would imagine that extra GPU compute power and bandwidth around expensive transparency effects like water make the RX 580 take such a lead here. If you would like to target a lock 60 FPS with these GPUs, then I recommend 1080p, where both GPUs can do a very healthy 60 FPS in cutscenes, but once again, the RX 580 will take the lead in gameplay scenarios, running 12% faster on average than the GTX 1060. The GTX 1060 can actually get dangerously close and even once dipped momentarily below 60 FPS next to the game's expensive water. So on such GPUs, you will really want 1080p for 60 FPS or 1440p for 30 FPS. Sadly, there's not great access to resolutions between 1440p and 4K with a resolution slider in this game. Whew. Now this has been a very long review, so let's recap. The biggest upgrades this PC version has over the PlayStation version are an anisotropic filtering, level of detail at a distance, and the frame rate and image quality can be much higher. If you have the proper GPU, the image quality in this game can be amazing, and of course better than the PlayStation 4 Pro version. And if you're curious about where and how much better, I recommend you check out my Checkerboard vs DLSS video for the complete analysis on that. In terms of performance, Death Stranding on PC performs really well across all GPUs, and 60 FPS and higher are attainable on mid-range CPU hardware. As I see it, the only faults are that this game does not scale high enough. I would love to see unlocked FPS in cutscenes, a resolution slider, and perhaps higher settings for things like depth of field, or even control over the game's motion blur shutter speed. You know, fine grained stuff that will allow this game to scale indefinitely into the future. But even with those smaller negative points, this is the definitive version of Death Stranding, and in my opinion really shows off well how much a higher frame rate helps a game. Not just for gameplay, but for visuals, which is something I think Hideo Kojima and his studio also think given their history. This is enough though from me for now. If you did like this in-depth look at the PC version of Death Stranding, hit that like button and subscribe to the channel. If you're already a subscriber, then consider hitting that little bell in the corner to be informed as soon as Digital Foundry posts a video. If you want to help us out, consider supporting Digital Foundry on Patreon to get years worth of Digital Foundry content available in high quality for download. If you want to talk to me about Death Stranding on PC and why 30fps perhaps doesn't cut it for you, write a comment below or follow me and Digital Foundry on Twitter. And as always, this is Alex, bidding you farewell and auf Wiedersehen!